Let's say that one day I decide to paint an object. I fill a bucket of paint with a finite volume of paint and within that bucket I start painting an object. I keep painting and painting but I don't seem to be able to finish painting the surface of this object even though it can contain a finite amount of paint. What I mean is if I pour all the paint inside this object I can fill it to the brim, but if I paint the surface of this object, I can't completely paint the surface. How is this even possible? Is it possible to have an object with a finite volume but an infinite surface area? During the 17th century, before the invention of calculus, found this apparent paradox with the nature of infinity. Let's consider the function f of x is equal to 1 over x. Instead of considering the domain negative infinity to infinity, we're looking at the function on the domain from 1 to infinity. Torricelli thought of the surface that would be formed after you rotate the function around the x-axis. Now if you've taken a calculus course before, you've probably heard of solids of revolution. This is basically what we're doing here. The name of the surface is called Gabriel's horn. Now why would this be true? How could the surface have infinite surface area but finite volume? Isn't the volume of something always supposed to be larger than the surface area? Well, let's try to calculate each of the quantities. To calculate the volume of Gabriel's horn, we're going to be using what's commonly called disk method. We're going to create small disks and sum them up. Let's look at one disk like this. We need to find the volume of one disk and then we can just add a lot of these disks to find the volume of the entire object. So let's look at the volume of one disk. Well the volume of a cylinder is pi r square h and since we're looking at a cylinder with a really 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 small width which is basically this disk, we'll say the height is dx. And the radius? It's simply the value of the function which is 1 over x. So the volume of one disk is pi r square h which is pi times 1 over x squared times dx. So to find the volume of the whole cylinder we need to sum up all the disks from 1 to infinity. So that's simply an integral so we take the integral from 1 to infinity of pi times 1 over x squared dx. So the trick to evaluate this is to use a limit. So we consider what the integral approaches as the upper bound approaches infinity. Evaluating the integral, we get negative 1 over x from x is equal to 1 to x is equal to t, which results in the limit as t approaches infinity of negative 1 over t plus 1 times pi. Since the limit as t approaches infinity of 1 over t is equal to 0, the integral is equal to pi. So the volume of Gabriel's horn is equal to pi. Now that we've shown that the volume enclosed by Gabriel's horn is finite, let's try to calculate its surface area. When calculating the volume of Gabriel's horn, we summed up disks, but for calculating the surface area, we're going to be summing up a solid called a frustum. A frustum is basically a section of a cone between two parallel lines. It looks like this. The surface area of a frustum is given by the following formula, 2 pi r l. So we need to sum up the surface area for all of these frustums. So let's try to calculate the surface area of one frustum. The radius is pretty simple, it's just 1 over x, like before. And let's try to calculate one of the side lengths. So if we look closely, we can form a triangle. The height of the triangle is a small change in y, which is dy, and the width is a small change in x, which is dx. So the length of the hypotenuse, which is L, is dx squared plus dy squared square rooted. And this is often abbreviated as ds. We can use a little bit of algebra and express this quantity ds as the square root of 1 plus dy by dx whole squared. So the surface area of one frustum is 2 pi times 1 over x dx. So to calculate the surface area of Gabriel's horn, we just need to evaluate the integral from 1 to infinity of 2 pi times 1 over x ds. 
Since we're integrating over x, we just need to replace ds with something in terms of x. And using the formula we had before, the derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared. So ds is equal to square root of 1 plus negative 1 over x squared whole squared. Now since we don't actually need to evaluate the integral, we just need to know if it converges or diverges. And since we kind of know it diverges, we can use a little trick to show this. So if we can show that this integral is greater than an integral that diverges, that means it equals infinity, then this integral has to diverge too, which makes sense. If it's always greater than something that equals infinity, it's going to be equal to infinity. So let's look at the square root term. Since we're squaring something, that value is always going to be more than zero. And since we're adding one, the square root term is always going to be more than one. So this integral is greater than the integral from one to infinity of two pi times one over x dx, which is a lot easier to evaluate. So using the method we had before, we just consider what the integral approaches as the upper bound approaches infinity. And since the integral of 1 over x is just ln of x, the limit is equal to the limit as t approaches infinity of 2 pi ln of x, which diverges. And thus, Gabriel's horn has infinite surface area. But when I first learned about this, I still had some doubt in my mind. How can something have infinite surface area but finite volume? Well. Let's look at another example of something like this, a fractal. A fractal, like Koch's snowflake, has infinite perimeter but finite area. Another way to think about this is the convergence of the series sigma 1 over 2 to the n, which is just 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth and dot dot dot. And since the horn's radius keeps decreasing to zero, the volume of Gabriel's horn is finite, but the surface area does not. So that's why the surface area is infinite. Thanks for watching.